This is Dr. Gooden with Cognitive and Language Development. Um, there's two chapters here um, that, that speak about cognition. Remember, cognition is thought. Um, and we're also going to talk about language development. So overall, just think about what level your students are going to be at um, or your trainees. What will they respond to? We just talked about behaviorism where there's very little cognitive uh, capacity. To, to rationally speak with them about what's going on. But even um, certain skills, um, some people are, are not going to be able to get until they're older, and some people will never be able to master certain skills. Um, we need to understand what people are able to do at different ages and why uh, as much as possible. So as we look into this chapter, um, we're going to see basic principles of human development. Development is somewhat predictable but it occurs at different rates for different people okay and we normally see stages and here's what normally occurs at age five to seven but of course that can be different for various individuals it may be age eight for others or nine um, puberty is often age 13 some girls at 11 some boys at probably 15 you get the idea um, although there are some universals in development, not all students will be on the same level. Um, okay, I'd, I'd even say there's a limited number of universals. Um, so we are, we're always going to have a mix of what students can do, and you're going to have that mix within your classroom, even if you have the honors classroom. Uh, but especially if you have a general classroom in a younger uh, grade, uh, the students are going to be less separated out in terms of ability and uh, maturation. Development is affected by both nature and nurture. Nature, of course, being their genetic and their biological disposition, what they're built with. Um, you're built with a good brain. You came from a family of intelligent people. Um, or, or you didn't. And then nurture being how society has trained you, how... Um, your family has trained you, what books you've been exposed to, what movies you've been exposed to, what schools you've gone to, um, and development is affected by both of these. So we commonly have this sort of argument of looking at both. Um, I'm going to go back. Nature, we have this, this maturation process, okay? where our skills do develop. Motor skills will develop in children differently depending greatly on their biological design. Okay, this is motor skills, what you do with your hands and, and feet and um, walking and talking and, and uh, your ability to do things physically. Um, and then temperament is it's like an early version of your personality. A person's tendency to be calm or irritable, outgoing or shy, adventuresome or cautious. And we're going to see that temperament you know, if you've got a fussy child, how does that affect the environment of the child? Well, they're less likely to be held. All right. A fussy child is less likely to be held. Is that true? Maybe not in your family, but in many situations, yes. So what happens to this child? Well, they're less likely to get that social um, praise, uh, less likely to get as much comfort less likely to be held by strangers and so we're seeing already in this example the effect of the temperament upon the environment and how the environment is reacting to the temperament thus the temperament that fussy temperament so to speak or irritable temperament we may call it is affecting the environment the environment's going to respond with less love and praise and warm fuzzies and the child is more likely to be less of a warm, fuzzy person, perhaps. Think about that. Let's look at nurture. Nurture is the idea that we um, brings in the idea that we have sensitive and critical periods um, in our development, a time period perhaps where early in development, um, we a, a growing child is most easily influenced by environmental conditions. There are certain ages we've seen um, in research that. Um, as a child, we're, we're able to learn languages more easily, um, especially to speak them um, than, than in adulthood. There are other things that um, if we don't learn them as children, it's going to be much more difficult later in life. Um, the theories of Jean Piaget and Lev Vygotsky propose what we can do to influence the development of our child as 
a society, as a family, as a parent, as a teacher, as an influence from an external source. Okay. So, development changes that occur between conception and death. Okay, between when you're born, well, actually before you're born, right? According to when your view of conception is, um, and and when you die. Okay, when 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 you become alive, so to speak, and when you die, those things that occur, um, and of course, smoking while pregnant uh, can hurt the the fetus. So. Um, that can affect development. Um, so that's that's why we, we use the word conception here. Um, and then death. Um, so we develop physically, personally, socially, cognitively. How do we change? Well, we get bigger, that's physically. We mature. We become better at speaking to people. Sometimes um, extroverted people may become more introverted. Cognitively, hopefully we're all learning. Um, our brains, we get smarter as time goes by and we learn more information, right? But then maybe later we get some sort of dementia. Cognitive faculties tend to decline in later age and we're unable to remember as well. We're unable to think as well. We're unable to remember names as well. Um, perhaps our long-term memory stays intact while our short-term memory um, uh, suffers. Maturation um, says that it occurs naturally and spontaneously, genetically programmed. Okay, this happens naturally. This is the way we're built to develop. Learning is interaction with our environment. This is nurture. Okay, it's what we learn. People develop at different rates. So, how will you see this in your students? Well, it's going to be somewhat obvious. Um, and we're not just talking about physically, but cognitively, what they're able to do with their with their minds, um, and also sit in the seats, you know, quietly versus not sit in the seats quietly. Um, development is relatively orderly. There is a logical progression, but it's not necessarily linear, linear or fully predictable. Development can take place gradually. Um, rarely happens overnight. Um, so how does this ha impact you and your teaching? Well, um, you need to pay attention to it. You need to pay attention, uh, and, and we, we struggle with this, if you're a trainer or a teacher, um, we struggle with the issue of having people at different levels in the same group that we're training or teaching. and to some degree, as, as teachers or trainers, we're expected to give individualized training. In other words, training that works for Jim Bob and training that also works for Sue and looks at their individual needs. But with, you know, the teacher can only do so much. So um, there's only a certain level of personalized attention that, that we can do um, in IEPs. So it is a struggle to find that, that balance of, of what to give in terms of individual attention to students um, or trainees. Um, in Piaget's theory of cognitive development, um, the thinking process changes. He said, all have a need to organize. We all have this need to organize and adapt to the demands of the physical environment to find what he called an equilibrium. Equilibrium means balance. Okay, We're adapting to our physical environment to find a balance. Okay, Schemas are mental networks of organized information and we make these. We, we see repeated patterns and we get used to these patterns. Um, they actually help us learn what to expect. Think of a stereotype. Think of what the first day of school um, might include. These schemas are frameworks. They're, they're organized information, sometimes in a pattern, 
um, of, of time of here's what's going to happen first and then second, third, and fourth, or thinking about what things go together. Well, whenever I see Jim Bob, I see Sue. Um, so we think of them as a as, as brother and sister, as a um, organized group. Um, Piaget's basic tendencies and thought um, back to equilibration, searching for that balance, and searching for this mental balance between cognitive schemas and information from the environment that is new. This is schemas are what we expect, and then there's always new information coming in that may fit with what we expect, or it may not. So when all our information is not fitting together, it's a state of disequilibrium, it's an out of balance state, realizing that the current way of thought does not work to solve problems or understand the situation. Going to a new job, we often feel this disequilibrium. We don't know the rules socially and we also don't know how to do the job maybe perfectly and it takes some acclimation, some time to get used to learning the rules and, and being used to things. Um, in each course, especially a, a strange teacher, a new teacher, um, who sort of does things differently, um, or even just each new teacher, you have to get used to, and learn. You know, part of part of what I always did was try to figure out what does this teacher want to see, what what gets what I need out of the course, what do I have to do to get what I need out of the course, um, what does this teacher like. You know, because you can write one essay for one teacher, it will get an A, right? Submit that same essay to a different teacher, it will get an F. People, you know, are different, and we need to understand um, their evaluation process. Of course, this is where rubrics help to syst uh, systematically sort of um, standardize how grading happens. Um, but often teachers do differ. Um, so adaptation is adjusting to our environment. We do that constantly. We adjust to our environment. There are two basic processes. As we get our new information, of course we're dealing with the environment. The environment is constantly giving us new information. We either assimilate that information into our ready-made schemas, the, the information that we have, the patterns we're used to. We understand something new by fitting it into the existing schema of what we already have. Hey, look at that cat. It looks like those other cats I've seen, right? Or look at that dog. Eh, it's a little smaller than I'm used to, but that's still a dog. I'm Okay, that works. And then there's a difference when we get to accommodation. We change our existing schema or scheme to respond to a new situation, to new information. We see a platypus, and somebody tells us, hey, that's a, that's a mammal. And I say, hey, I've never seen a duckbill on a mammal before, or webbed feet, or these, this mixture of, of different characteristics in a mammal. I'm not used to it. I'm used to a mammal looking like a gorilla or, or something more normal, right? If it's normal, if it fits with our schema, we assimilate it. If it's something new, we accommodate it. When I was really young, I used to think that all dogs were male and all cats were female. Well, this, of course, was a schema that did not work. I could not assimilate new information very long. Eventually, somebody told me that was a male cat, and that did not work with my schema. I had to accommodate that new information and learn that Cats can be male or female. Dogs can be male or female. Assimilation involves some accommodation. In very unfamiliar situations, we may use neither. We may just be totally lost and have to build a schema from scratch, so to speak. Piaget's theory of cognitive development. He said, a real problem is, what is the goal of education? He was very interested in education. Are we forming children who are only capable of learning what is already known? Or should we try to develop creative and innovative minds capable of discovery from the preschool age on throughout life? Now, Piaget would probably not like our current education system, K through 12 and especially beyond. Going to college, 
has become sort of a choice. Many students do not go for the purpose of becoming thinkers. They go so they can get a job. And there's a reason for that. What did Piaget believe is the goal of education? Is it to become a thinker or to get a job? Piaget's theory of cognitive development, he talked about thinking processes change radically, though slowly. So they, they change slowly, but man, can they, they change a whole lot. Okay, it just takes time. Constantly strive to make sense of our world. That's what we're doing. We're constantly taking in information, accommodating or assimilating. Three factors, maturation, which is unfolding of genetically programmed biological changes. So think of that one as the biological. Activity, acting on our environment and learning, organize our thinking from the environment. So this is our interaction with the environment as we act upon the environment and learn from it. And then social transmission is interacting uh, with others, with other um, humans, social transmission. And Piaget talked about these stages. Um, he really didn't talk much about the adult. So let's look at the first four. Sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational. And these are the ages um, that he was speaking about. Zero to two, we should have some level of perception and being able to do some physical actions. In pre-operational stage, um, we still have an egocentric perspective. Uh, we learn some early symbolic language like what, what a hand up that says no means or to be quiet, uh, but we're really bad at, at differentiating between fantasy and reality. Um, it looks like a unicorn, even though it's a horse, I'm going to call it a unicorn. And then we, 7 to 11, we, we kind of put away childish ways to some degree we start um, becoming an adult, um, perhaps. Uh, we become more organized, more logical thought, but it's very black and white, very concrete. Um, concrete but not abstract. We do not um, do much abstract problem solving. That abstract problem solving comes in formal operational stage, age 11 um, through adulthood. Thinking less, <coughs> excuse me, thinking is less tied to concrete reality and can generate and test multiple hypotheses. There's a misspelling. We can consider hypotheticals even if they are physically impossible. What would happen if everybody had no thumbs? Man, we would have trouble picking things up. Um, you know, what would happen if I tried this solution out? And we're able to try out hypothetical situations in, um, in our thought processes and imagine things. Um, it's, not, it's not getting confused with what is fantasy and reality. It's, it's exploring um, with imagination. Um, in adulthood, he proposed that we have no new cognitive skills developing, but we accommodate, we assimilate, and we continue to gain knowledge. So child's thinking in the sensory motor stage is based on the senses. Um, we have we learn object permanence that, you know, the game peekaboo. Uh, even though the face is covered, uh, we know the face is still there. We learn that um, normally towards the end of the zero to two age. Um, development. Objects exist in the environment whether uh, we can see them, perceive them, or not. Uh, and we have goal-directed actions starting to de develop among these um, infants. Um, separate lower level schemes organized into higher level schemes to achieve a goal. Think of the baby that continues to throw the toy every time you pick it up. Okay, what are they doing? They're learning a pattern. Okay. Um, and they probably like that game. They probably like throwing food, too. All right. Pre-operational stage. Here's a kid with blocks. What's he doing? Major accomplishments. Semiotic function. Ability to form and use symbols to represent actions or objects mentally. Okay. Okay. Might be able to say, I'm hungry. and Make a motion that means that. Show schemes become becoming more general. So able to make more complex schemes. Uh, if you see the word schemes versus schemas, don't don't get scared. Um, they are the same idea. Um, characteristics, um, difficulty with with these things. Um, 
And so they're struggling as they start to do this reversible thinking. Well, if I break this, can I put it back together? Um, and they, they, they struggle with this cognitively. Um, the idea of conservation is something they begin to learn, characteristic of an object to remain the same despite changes in physical appearance. So if I pour a tall glass of water into a shorter but wider glass of water, is it still still the same amount of water? Yes, that's the, the law of conservation. And then centration is focusing on more than one aspect at a time. They have difficulty with this, but they learn. They have a tendency to be very egocentric and have uh, what Piaget called a collective monologue. Children um, sit in a group, they have group talk, but do not really interact or communicate. So they'll sit all together in a group, you know, these, these toddlers, um, and they'll talk aloud, but not to each other. And Piaget explained this as being a selfish, egocentric uh, pattern that they do. We'll see that Vygotsky uh, had a different explanation for it. Uh, symbolic thought in the pre-operational stage, we use symbols to represent the actual objects. Okay, We can use these blocks to represent a, an actual building. We use pretend play, use the objects, you know, I might use that rectangular block there and pretend it's a car. Okay, those were the days when things were cheap, toys were cheap back then. Just give me a block and I'll pretend it's a car. Use of the objects that are available in the environment to represent another object not available in the environment. I'd, I wonder if there's, you know, that'd be neat to look into how much pretend play um, has decreased uh, in our current era uh, in new younger generations. In the concrete operational stage, there's recognition of logical stability of the world. Okay, we understand patterns. Okay, okay, this is that law of conservation. Okay, tall beaker, smaller, wider beaker. There's a logical system of thought, but still tied to physical reality. When we have these con these accomplishments, uh, we learn conservation um, depends on three aspects identity the person or object remains the same over the over time there's compensation changes in one dimension can be offset by changes in another even though this is shorter it's wider and then classification grouping objects into categories um, we begin to be able to do that quite well in the concrete operational stage Reversibility, we think through a series of steps and then we can reverse those steps, all right? Um, we can say, well, we, um, let's see, let me think of a good example. Um, I'm not sure I can. Um, we can, you know, move furniture around in the living room. I'm, I'm thinking about furniture because I'm sitting in my living room and I'm thinking about moving around the furniture. Could I put it back where it was? Reversibility, we're able to think through that series of, of moving things around and then putting them back. And seriation is making an orderly arrangement. Okay, understanding that things go in um, an order and that step by step we can, we can, we can see the pattern of behavior. Step one, step two, step three, etc. In the formal operational stage, things get a little more interesting. These are when your nieces and nephews and children perhaps become maybe a little obnoxious, but you can actually have conversations with them. You can talk about good music and think about what the lyrics might mean. Focus of thinking can shift from what is what, what sorry, what is to what might be hypotheticals. Accomplishments. We have this called hypothetical deductive reasoning. We consider a hypothetical situation and we resolve it by identifying all the important factors and systematically evaluating solutions. Okay. Inductive reasoning. Using specific observations to identify general principles. That's the opposite of deductive reasoning, right? Inductive means one example spread to other uh, possibilities. Deductive is looking at what you've seen and deducing 
what would happen in a specific situation. In the formal operational stage, we think abstractly and coordinate the number of variables. Adolescent egocentrism. We understand others have very different viewpoints sometimes, but we're very focused on our own viewpoint. You need to know that if you're going to teach adolescents. It leads to imaginary audience. The idea that everyone's watching me, sort of a paranoia. Um, sort of that idea, you know, where I was, I want to show off my basketball skills for anybody that was driving by. Surely they would see me um, making a layup because they were watching me as they drove by. Um, and as teenagers, we, we think we are the center of the world. Um, and and that's, that's sort of a normal behavior. Um, do we all get there? Do we all get to this formal operational stage? Not everyone and not to the same extent. So how does this apply to lesson planning, interpretation of stories? Um, if we were to read Aesop's fables, uh, ask the children, what do you think this story means? We're going to have different abilities. The response differs depending on the cognitive level. How do you think a pre-operational student versus a concrete operational student would respond? What cognitive level is your student is always a good question for you to ask. Are they pre-operational? They're not going to be sensory motor normally. Um, if they are, response is emotional, personal, level based on emotional reaction or affective reaction. They're um, likely to mention something that happened um, in their own lives. May not be interested in explaining or justifying the answer. Okay, concrete operational response is based on the literal content of the story. Okay, and informal operational, the response goes beyond the literal content of the story and starts to indicate some understanding of the moral components perhaps behind the story. Okay. Now, so think about this. When you watch SpongeBob, you're getting a whole different um, story than what your child is getting. You're getting lots of adult jokes that maybe aren't meant to be understood by your child. Limitations of Piaget's theory. Um, there's a problem with the idea of separate stages um, because things are really not um, that simple. They're not separated into stages that well. Um, Piaget underestimated cognitive abilities of children and was unable to explain how some young children can perform at very advanced levels in certain areas. Like think of a, a child prodigy on the piano or something like that. And overlooks a lot of uh, cultural and social aspects um, and, and differences between culture. Vygotsky came along and he added a lot of emphasis um, that, that talked about um, how we interact with society and what we learn from society. The role of social interaction in our cognitive development. Um, he, all right, so Piaget said we sit, you know, as toddlers we sit around and talk to each other. We pretend to be talking to ourselves on this cell phone. And we sit around and, and we're selfish. We're egocentric, so to speak. Okay, but Vygotsky He, he had a different idea behind what we did. He said we're learning a process of thought. Um, the first thing we do is um, say we lose a toy. Okay, Our parents teach us a pattern of finding the toy. Okay, Did you look under your bed? Nope. Did you look in the backyard? Nope. Or, or yes, I, I look in each place as parents says to do so. Did you look in the car under the seat? Uh, nope. Oh, there it is. So we learn a pattern of finding the lost thing, and the you know the parent maybe says it out loud. What does the child do next? Well, they reach a stage perhaps where they start saying it out loud. Did I look under my bed? Did I look in the backyard? Did I look under the seat in the car? Okay, and they'll say it out loud. Next stage is is their friend at school loses their toy. Did you look under the bed? They will say out loud to their friend. 
Okay. So when they're saying it to themselves, not to a friend, that's that private speech, um, which um, they're practicing what their parents have taught them. Uh, this this the speech later becomes inner speech, private, um, self-vocalized, but it's a stage of of um, speech being said aloud by the parent, to being said aloud by the child, to being said aloud by the child to other children. That's the next stage, and then eventually learning that it's not socially appropriate to be saying all your thoughts out loud all the time. So we start to keep our thoughts privately. And then every now and then you have a hard math problem or something that you're having a difficult uh, time with thinking about and you start to say the numbers out loud. You start to read it out loud to yourself. Um, and you're sort of regressing back to that stage where you need to use what we call your phonological loop. Now, Vygotsky also added this, um, the ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development, was really an important idea um, for educati education. Um, he said, this is the child's current achievement. Here's what they're capable of. And if we give them just a little bit of help in, in doing this, um, here's some math problems they're used to, and they can do at this level. It, but with a little bit of help, they can do these, not calculus, but these, you know, that are a little beyond what they're capable of alone. And if we give them a little bit of help, they're able to do these things and to learn. And by pushing them into the ZPD, they progress um, in their learning a lot more quickly. So teachers should be constantly pushing children into their zone of proximal development. Uh, not into things that they they can't do even with help. Not where the teacher's just doing it for them or the parent's doing it for them. But to where something that is in between what they can do alone and what they um, have, you know, it's just beyond reach. Okay. So we learn to scaffold. That's that process. We scaffold the processing by helping them um, by assisting them, we can do it in, in a number of ways. We can scaffold the process. Um, say, you know, let's let's start with uh, this level, and oh, you've mastered that level. Let's try one step f further, one step harder. Uh, guided participation. I'm going to guide you through this, and you'll get it. Uh, cognitive apprenticeship is sort of the idea here. I'm going to walk you through this. We're going to think about it together. Um, Criticism of Vygotsky's thinking, uh, he underestimated children's ability to learn, some say. Uh, the verbal dialogue is not, is not the only and the most important means in learning. Uh, and he failed to recognize some biological contributions uh, to children's cognitive growth. So there could be some debate. Um, um, you can look at this, think about it on your own. If you haven't paused recently, uh, now might be a time, but you know, here's just a debate. Calculators and spell checkers are crutches that harm learning, or they support learning. What do you think? Next, I'll be speaking about cognitive views of learning. Thank you. This is Dr. Gooden.